Modifying a 5 inch gauge Great Western Railway 14XX steam locomotive. This is part 1, an overview of the build quality. And before I start, this is not a King Scale or Silvercrest model locomotive. This engine was bought directly from the manufacturer in China. It was originally delivered directly to Blackgate's engineering because the manufacturer was having problems making the injector work. I repiped it correctly and now the injector works fine. It's still in the wrong place, it's underneath at the back, it needs to be moved to the side and this is one of quite a few modifications I'll be making to this engine during this series. As you can see clearly the engine is now on my workbench and I'm setting it up currently on a rolling road so I can actually run the engine without it going anywhere. I bought these rolling road units recently and they really are very good, they're from a company called CMD Engineering. And what I intend to do is use these three rolling road units and build them into a purpose-built rolling road for this locomotive, complete with a gas burner, so that whenever I feel like it, I can put the locomotive on the bench and steam it up. But for now, I'm just using them loose on the bench, and they seem to be okay like this. What I'm not going to do in this series is be negative about this engine, and I'm not going to drone on and on and on about things that are wrong with it. There are one or two things wrong with it, maybe three or four or five or six things wrong with it, but they're all fairly simple things, and when I look at the bigger picture, most of the vital parts of this engine are very well made. It's minor things like the thickness of the pipe that supports the pressure gauge. It's too long and it's a bit thin and a bit feeble, and would allow the pressure gauge to vibrate when the engine was running. So I removed it, and I'm using a piece of silicone rubber pipe and a nylon tie wrap on the junction where the pressure gauge was mounted to put some compressed air into the boiler. As you can hear, the engine is now running on the rolling road, albeit slowly with very little pressure in the boiler, and it's immediately apparent that there's a slight leak around the regulator bush. This is not a big job to fix, but oddly enough, when Phil and I steamed this at Blackgate's Engineering, we never noticed a leak from this part of the engine. There were a couple of leaks when we first steamed this engine, one from the turret and one from the water gauge glass, mainly because the glass was cracked. So how does it run? It seems to run quite well. I was quite surprised. I thought it would be a lot lumpier than this, but no, it's okay. That was in forward gear, now for reverse. It's not quite as even in reverse gear, it could do with maybe a minor tweak, but for now I'll put it back in forward gear. The reverser is quite fiddly to get at, it's very close to the cab side and my hands are a bit on the huge side, but it does rotate quite freely. By the feel of it though, the reverser needs some oil, so I'll give it some of my magic mixture, and once I did that, it became a lot easier to turn. This engine has a very large displacement lubricator at the front of one of the tanks on the side. So at the moment, as it's not running on steam, the cylinders are not getting any oil. But judging by the amount of oil coming out of the chimney, there's enough oil in the cylinders for now. One of the things I'm definitely going to do is improve the layout and size of the cab fittings. Everything's just a little bit too big. The valves are too big, the water gauge is too big, and the regulator's too big. And the whistle valve is horrible although it works fine. With the regulator almost closed and the engine in forward gear, obviously it's running slowly. There seems to be a tight spot, but at this stage I'm not going to go into obsess mode over this because it could just be that it needs running in. So that's what I'm going to do. Over the next few weeks I'll run this engine very frequently on the bench on this rolling road until it runs a little bit smoother and if it doesn't then I will investigate further. But for now, I'm just going to oil the parts and make sure that everything's running smoothly. The regulator is very responsive. In this clip, I'm attempting to get the wheels in the right position so I can apply some oil to the crosshead. Unlike Walshart's valve gear, 
internal Stevenson's link valve gate is more difficult to get at with the oil can. As you listen to this clip, don't listen to the whirring noise, listen to the little chuffing noises in the background. So listening to that, the beats are fairly even. I'm quite pleased with it so far. In this series, you will see me stripping down this engine. I won't be stripping it down all the way. I'll strip it down sufficiently to be able to do the jobs that I need to do on the engine and show you how it's put together. This is the crank axle and the valve gear underneath the engine. And as you can see, it looks quite well made. There's a little bit of side rattle, but that's not a big problem. When I put a screwdriver in between those two parts that are moving in the centre, they stop moving. This is an ideal opportunity to put some more oil into the works. It's worth remembering that in and amongst all these mechanical moving parts, there is an axle pump. And axle pumps can have an effect on the smoothness of running of a locomotive. Frequently, owners remove axle pumps from the engine just to make them run more smoothly because on the pump stroke there's considerable resistance so the engine goes up and down the track unevenly. But as most of the time this is going to sit on my sideboard, I'm not going to remove the axle pump, I'll leave it just as it is. Here's a close-up of the crank axle. And oh, shock horror, the crank webs appear to be secured to the crankshaft and the crank pins using grub screws. But upon closer inspection, I can see that the crank webs are welded to the crankshaft, which makes for a much stronger crank axle. This is something you don't often see. This is the boiler firebox looking from underneath, and the thing at the top that's sticking out is the superheater. This is a radiant superheater, not a steam dryer. This is the real thing, and it will produce very, very hot steam at the cylinders. I just hope that the cylinders and pistons and piston rings are made of the right kind of material to stand this kind of superheat. Although this part of the series, the first episode, is meant to be an overview, I just had to get rid of these pipes. This is the water outlet from one of the tanks, and it goes to the balancing pipe in the middle, and this is where the water comes from to feed the axle pump and the injector. The manual feed pump, the hand pump, is mounted inside one of the tanks and takes its water directly from inside the tank. These copper pipes are very thin wall copper pipes, so as they've been bent, they're a little bit kinked. I'm going to replace most of the piping on this engine, and for that I'm going to use commercial piping, which is 3 16 of an inch diameter, you can buy it in rolls from motorist discount shops, and it is thick walled copper hydraulic brake piping for cars. In my opinion, there's a slight design flaw in this engine. So you fill up the tanks with water and you run the engine, and then it's time to go home and the tanks are still full of water. How do you get the water out of the tank? Well, that's obvious. You just turn the engine upside down and shake it till the water pours out of the tanks. No, I'm going to fit a drain tap to this system. So that's it for the basic overview. In the next episode, I'll start dismantling the engine. Thanks for watching, and I hope you found it useful.